earned. So, for example, if you trespass on another uh, your neighbor's property without being authorized, uh, trespass to persons. So, trespass to persons, you can be able to talk about, for example, battery. So, for example, if you end up injuring a person in terms of battery, you are going to look at that. Then also trespass to uh, to goods. So, trespass to land. How does it actually occur? So, how does it actually occur? So it occurs whenever a person uh, or a plaintiff possession in land is wrongfully interfered with. So the key thing here is possession and not necessarily ownership. As such, the plaintiff can be the owner or the tenant. So in this case, we are talking about uh, where a person has possession or ownership. What do you mean by possession? For example, if it is maybe land you've leased, that particular land you don't own it because the title is not actually you just leased or rented that particular land. So you become a lessee, or basically in that case, a lessee. And then therefore, in this case, you just possess the land. So the rights will actually basically be attached to you in terms of possession. So still, you have the rights over the land, even if that particular land is actually being held you under possession and not actually ownership. So that's why we are saying it will refer to either possession or actually ownership of property. So if you've rented the property, you are using it for maybe a particular period of time. It simply means that yeah. you have the rights over that particular yeah. property. And therefore, so no authorized person should actually access your property that you are possessing, that you've rented without actually that authorizing that such kind of a person. More, so it can relate to either ownership of the property game. or maybe possession of property. So still, the owner of the land has the rights to be able to ensure no one actually accesses or trespasses to the land without his or her authority. So even if it is an apartment that you've actually rented, so if a person actually basically accesses your apartment without authorizing such kind of a person, so in that rented apartment of yours, so it simply means that uh, such a person mm -hmm. is actually accessing that property you have possession as a tenant without having authorized the person. So it can relate to either possession of property or maybe ownership of property. So it depends and in what capacity, in what capacity the person is actually holding the property. Is it under possession or maybe ownership? So in case of unauthorized access, then the other person or the plaintiff can be able to sue for what we call trespass to land, trespass to land. And in this case, when you talk about land under law, when you talk about land under law, so we mean the land itself and of course, anything that is actually annexed or attached to, to land. For example, buildings, they'll still be taken or be categorized as being land. So that's what we are talking about, for example, an apartment, an authorized access to your apartment. So it can still actually be categorized under trespass to land. So in law, in land, we simply mean land itself. And of course, anything that is actually annexed to land. Let's say, for example, buildings. In such a case, they actually annex to land, so they basically compose or form a component of land under, under law. So it can occur in the following ways. So by wrongfully entering on the plaintiff's land, so e.g. encroaching, walking through, so you just walk through a person's land. So that is basically trespass. Or it can actually happen whereby you remain on a person's land without having been authorized or getting the authority to be able to remain in such a person's land. So maybe you had leased the property. So the lease has actually come to an end. So it was supposed to be, let's say, for example, for a year, but it's now over a year, you have not actually left the land. So it will be basically be presumed like you've actually trespassed on the land because you have no, and you, ha you are basically on the land without having been authorized, without having been authorized by the owner. So trespass by placing things on the land. So you can place maybe some items on the land without having been authorized. So it, it's worth noting that this trespass is different from nuisance in that the thing placed on the land directly affects the plaintiff's procession, unlike nuisance, which affects how they enjoy the property. So nuisance, unlike trespass, is concerned with enjoyment and not actually possession. So you remember what we talked about nuisance. So if you cause a person not to be able to enjoy the rights over his property or the enjoyment of his property, so maybe through the escape of fumes or gases, then you can be accused of what we call nuisance. So maybe it could be noise or maybe it could be smoke. It could be fumes or gases. 
So such a case, we can be able to, uh, the person can accuse the other party of what we call nuisance. But of course, in this case, when we talk about uh, trespass, it is the unauthorized access to a person's land without having been authorized. In such a case, you can either maybe just walk over the land or actually encroach on the land or remain on the land without having been authorized, or simply you can actually be able to say by placing certain things on another person's land without getting the authority, without getting the authority. So uh, what are the defenses? So what are the defenses we said for each, each and every uh, type, each and every type of tort, for each and every type of tort uh, will have uh, the form of defense. For each and, and every type of tort, will have the form of defense. So prescription, so you, a person can be able to defend himself if he has been accused of uh, the tort of trespass with regard to land through what we call prescription. So land acquired by possession is also said to, be, to have been acquired by prescription. So the new owner may plead title by prescription as a defense to an action brought by a previous owner to recover the land. A defendant may also plead prescription as by proving a right of common grazing or right of way over the plaintiff's land. So maybe it is something that has been happening for quite some time. So basically, it simply means that it is like it has been prescribed. So the person has been passing over the land for or maybe a number of years without any form of uh, being queried, without any form of being queried or asked as to why exactly passing over the land. So he has gotten used to it. So it is like now a norm. He has gotten used to it. And of course, it can actually basically be presumed eh? through prescription, he had the right to be able to, to, to encroach over a person's land or trespass over a person's land. So you can be able to plead this as a form of defense by simply saying that through prescription, I basically assumed that I'm not actually basically committing any wrong by trespassing or basically walking over a person's land because there was a way which had been created. There was a road which had been created over the land that has been had been used for maybe a number of years without any person having asked as to why that basically this road is actually passing over the land. So through prescription, so something that has been done for a number of years without any questioning. So you can be able to plead as that as a defense and encroached as a result of what we call uh, prescription. Then uh, act of necessity. So maybe it could be out of necessity. So maybe there is a disaster in your neighbor's property. So you trespass so that you can be able to maybe assist or save uh, the situation. So there's a disaster of fire. Probably your neighbors will actually come to your land so, to, so that they can be able to maybe assist you put out the fire. So you can't accuse them of what we call trespass with regard to land. So they can plead that as a defense. So the, nece the necessity may be pleaded as a defense to an action of trespass to land, e.g. entry to put out fire for public safety. So the person's trespassed as a result of ensuring that disaster of fire out of necessity. So that particular event was a necessity that led to a trespass or people basically trespassing to put out uh, the fire. Statutory authority is another one. Statutory authority is another one. So this is where we say the law has actually basically authorized. So any statute law that has been passed through parliament or has been approved through parliament is giving authority to you to be able to trespass over a person's land. So through statutory authority, then of course it simply means that that can be pleaded as a form of defense. So I simply trespassed as a result of a statute law. So entry by license, so entry by license. So this is where, for example, a person has been authorized as, or has been given a license to be able to uh, maybe carry out certain works over your land. So maybe it could be an officer, let's say, for, for example, from the Kenya Power and Lighting Company. So he has the authority or the right to be able to come and actually monitor the meters, electricity meters. So through license, he has the right to entry. So that can be still be pleaded as a form of defense, as a form of defense.
So that can still be pleaded as a form of defense. Uh, what are the remedies? So the remedies in respect of trespass to land include number one, damages. So the damages can actually be given as a remedy by the court. So if the person has been accused of what we are calling trespass, then the court can basically give a remedy of damages. So by damages, we simply mean that uh, uh, all the losses or all the damages incurred as a result of the trespass, uh, as a result of the trespass, can actually uh, basically be compensated for. So if there are, for example, crops destroyed, so that is a loss that was actually incurred by the plaintiff. So in this case, the plaintiff can actually be compensated. So that is what we mean by the damages. So the damages incurred can actually be compensated. The court can basically give out an order for the damages to be compensated or actually paid for. So the plaintiff may recover monetary compensation from the defendant. So he can recover monetary compensation from the defendant, from the defendant. So ejection, so uh, ejection, so ejection, ejection, ejection. So ejection simply means that, for example, if a person has maybe remained on a person's property without authority, so the court can give out an ejection order that he be evicted or basically ejected from, from the property. So uh, as we saw earlier on that, a person is entitled to use reasonable force to defend his property. That's where a person wrongfully enters or remains on another's land. He may be ejected using reasonable force and may entail liability for assaults or ejectment may also be based on a court order. So the court can give out an order for ejection that a person be ejected from that particular uh, piece of land. Action for recovery of land. So a person can be able to uh, go to the courts and bring an action or bring a case as to how he can be able to recover his land. So if people are basically encroaching on the land and they don't want to move away. So the plaintiff may bring an action or a case to recover his land from the defendant where there has been a wrongful dispossession. It is common for such action to be coupled with the above two remedies. Then injunction. So injunction is uh, simply this, uh, to stop a person, to give out an injunction order. So in addition to the above remedies, an injunction may be obtained to ward off or basically stop off a person or a threaten, who threatens to trespass or to prevent the continuance of an existing one. So what we mean by injunction is a court order that can actually be given to stop a person from basically undertaking a certain action. So that court order is actually known as an injunction. So it can be given to a person to stop or not to do any form of uh, trespass on another person's land. So once the court has given that, that, that particular order, then you go against it, then it simply means that you'll be held responsible or liable. You'll actually be held responsible or liable. Distress damage feasance. So in the case of trespass by placing things on the land, the plaintiff has a right to detain the defendant's chattel or animal, which is the cause of the trespass in question. So in this case, you are talking about, for example, if the trespass is with regard to maybe another person's animals crossing over to another person's land, so the person can be able to detain those particular items that are being placed on his land or those animals that are basically encroaching on another person's land. So he has that particular right to be able to maybe retain or detain them maybe until when he's actually compensated for any losses incurred as a result of the trespass, for any losses incurred as a result of uh, the trespass. So that is simply what we mean by <coughs> trespass with regard to land. So the unauthorized access to another person's land or entering another person's land without any form of authorization or authority. So this land can actually either be having been owned or maybe it is actually basically simply being possessed. So trespass to persons, trespass to persons. So uh, trespass to persons, we have, uh, it can be of two forms. So we can have assault or maybe battery. So we can have assault or battery. 
So what we mean by assault is simply where a person instills threat in another person's mind. So you basically instill threat in another person's mind. But now, for example, if you go ahead and actually basically now take any action to injure the person, then it can actually basically now be taken as being battery. So assault, it occurs when a person intentionally threatens to use force against another person without lawful justification. Hence, putting the person in fear, e.g. pointing a gun towards him. So you just instill some form of fear. So maybe you hold the person, shuts and actually shake him so that you instill some form of fear in his mind. If you do such, then you say you've actually committed a form of trespass known as uh, assault, a form of trespass known as assault. So that is what we mean by uh, assault. That is what we mean by assault. Function So, so we are saying that uh, when you talk about assaults uh, with regard to trespass to persons, uh, it is simply where a person instills fear in another person's mind. So it is where a person intentionally threatens to use force against another person without justification, hence putting the person in fear, e.g. pointing a gun towards him. So like point a person. So... Uh, so these are some of the rules that actually basically relate to what we call assault or basically how you can be able to realize a person has been able to uh, maybe commit a wrong known as assault. So there must be some apprehension or contact. So there must be a means of carrying out the threat by the defendant. The thought is actionable per se, or basically the thought is actionable the way it actually appears or how it was actually basically done or carried out. The total is generally associated with battery. So it is related to battery, but we'll see just after this, battery is a bit different. So mere words without body movement do not actually constitute assault. So there must be some form of apprehension or some force that is being used. So that's when basically it can be concluded that basically it is assault. So it is constituted by display of show of force, pointing of a load, for example, pointing of a loaded gun, casting in a threatening manner. So if a person threatens you, so of course it can basically be taken as being assault. But now basically when now you proceed and actually basically let's say for example, injure the person, then now it is no longer assault, it is actually now what we call battery. So battery is the actual use of force towards another person without lawful justification, e.g. hitting a person. It is only actionable if it is a voluntary or intentional. So intention assault is committed where the plaintiff apprehends the commission of a battery on his person. If the defendant does not intend to commit a battery, but induce, induces a belief in the plaintiff's mind that he is about to do so, he is nevertheless li liable for what we call assault. So in this case, for example, if you just induce a belief without having to cause any injury, so induce a belief in a person's mind that you'll injure him, so for example, if you threaten him and basically tell the person, I'll injure you basically tomorrow, that is basically taken as being assault and not actually battery. So pointing a loaded gun at a person is of course assault, but if the gun is unloaded, it is still assault unless the person at whom it is pointed knows this. Knows this. 
So we are saying there should be some form of apprehension. So suppose the plaintiff, so suppose the plaintiff, suppose the plaintiff is an unusually fearful person in whom the defendant can induce fear of the of an imminent battery through a reasonable man would not have fear in those circumstances. Uh, does the defendant actually commit assault? So the, the better view is that the test is based upon the subjective intention of both parties. Thus, there is battery if the defendant intends to create fear of commission of a battery, whether or not, whether or not he knows he knows the plaintiff to be a fearful person and the plaintiff actually has this particular uh, fear. So that is basically what we mean by battery. So where you basically proceed and actually cause an injury. So you cause some form of apprehension and actually injury, then it will no longer actually be assault. So that's what we are saying. Assault and battery are actually related. So whereby you just instill fear, only fear, instilling fear, without causing any form of injury, it will be taken as being uh, assault. But of course, if you go ahead and actually cause an injury or hit a person, let's say, for example, hit a person, uh, in such a case, it will be taken as being uh, battery and not actually assault. So what are the rules? What are the rules of uh, uh, battery or what are the key characteristics or elements that must be present for it to be concluded that a person has actually committed what we call battery. So there was no actually consent. So what you did was not actually consented to or actually accepted by the plaintiff. So that act you did, that act you carried out leading to battery was not actually consented to by uh, the plaintiff. In such a case, it will be taken as being battery. So the act is based on, the, on an act of the defendant mere obstruction is not actually battery. If so, if the act is actually based on mere jazz of obstruction, it is not actually battery. So a contact caused by an accident over which the defendant has no control is not actually battery. For example, if you accidentally step on another person's feet while moving maybe around the streets, so that is basically accidental. So you didn't do it actually intentionally. So there's no way basically that can actually basically be taken as being battery. So there must be contact with the person of, if of the plaintiff, it has been observed. The least touching of another person in anger is actually battery. So it must be direct and the conduct must follow from the defendant act. The thought is actionable the way it appears or we can say per se. So per se basically in, in Latin means the way it actually appears. So the essence of the battery is to protect a person from unpermitted contacts with this body. The principal remedy is monetary award in damages. So mostly the remedies are usually monetary award in damages. So that is what we mean by assault and actually battery. So assault is you are simply saying you just instill fear. So you don't cause any injury or harm. But if you go ahead and actually cause the injury or harm, then it will be taken as being battery and not actually assault and not actually assault. So false imprisonment, so it is another form of trespass to persons. So false imprisonment is basically where you deprive a person's freedom of movement. For example, if you lock a person in a room, so this particular person has no capability to be able to move around, has no freedom to move around. So the person can, be, can accuse you of what we call false imprisonment. It could actually also be in the open space or open area. So long as that particular person has been deprived of the freedom of movement, so long as he has been deprived of the freedom of movement, then it simply means that uh, uh, the person will actually be able to sue or bring an action of what we call uh, false imprisonment. So it occurs when a person is deprived of their freedom without legal explanation, e.g. locking someone in a room without his authority. So what are the main elements, what are the main ingredients of this particular thought? So knowledge of the plaintiff. So knowledge of the restraint is not necessary, but may affect the quantum of damages. So they have used a case law there to explain uh, that particular point. So in that case law, the plaintiff was being questioned at the defendant's company in connection with certain thefts. 
from the defendant's company. He did not know of the presence of two police outside the room who would have prevented his leaving if necessary. It was held, it was held that the defendant was liable for false imprisonment. It appears to me that particular justice actually said, or that particular judge said, it appears to me that a person can be imprisoned without his knowing. I, I think a person can be imprisoned while he is asleep or in a state of drunkenness, while unconscious or while he is actually lunatic. Of course, the damages might be, dis, might be diminished and would be affected by the question whether he was conscious or not. So it simply means that uh, the knowledge of the plaintiff sometimes might not actually be necessary. So maybe you can basically be locked in a room so while you are basically still asleep. So in such a case, uh, those particular, uh, that particular act or those particular actions uh, will lead to what we call uh, false imprisonment. So intention and directness. So the thought is defined to exclude negligent imprisonment of another person. The thought must be intentional and should be committed directly. So it should be something that is actually very intentional. So not by, uh, for example, if you accidentally lock the person in the room without knowing that he's actually in the room, that does not actually basically lead to what you are calling false imprisonment. So you can accidentally lock someone in the house, assuming he has actually already left the house. So that is actually basically not intentional. It's just through maybe a mistake or basically an error. So if a person has to plead or basically to bring an action of what you are calling false imprisonment, it should actually clearly be identified. It was very intentional. So the person who locked that other person in the room did it intentionally so this particular so that this particular person is deprived of his right of movement so the act should actually be very intentional and should actually be very direct then the restraint must actually be very complete so not that they have actually locked you in the house and of course the windows are actually open so it simply means that you can jump through the windows and you'll have the freedom of movement so the restraint should actually be very complete so in this case if it is actually being locked in the house even the windows are not actually opening. So you can't even jump through the windows as the plaintiff. So the restraint must actually be very complete. The restraint must actually be very uh, complete. So the restraint must be uh, complete. So what are the rules of this particular thought? So the thought must actually be very intentional. It is immaterial that the defendant acted maliciously. The restraint or confinement must be total or very complete. Then uh, the thought, uh, the, it has been observed every confinement of a person is an imprisonment, whether it is be in a common prison, private house, or in the stocks, or even forcibly detaining one in the public. Then number five, the boundary of the area of confinement is fixed by the defendant. The barriers need not to be physical, a restraint affected by the assertion of authority is still sufficient. Then the imprisonment must be direct and the plaintiff need not to have been aware of the restraint. So the thought is actionable the way it actually appears. So the evidence will actually be quite enough by looking at what actually happened, what actually appeared or what actually appears in that particular wrong or action. So the principal remedy is monetary award or damages. So it's monetary award or uh, damages, monetary award or damages.
So what are the defenses? What are the defenses? Uh, uh, one of the defenses is what we call parental authority. So what do you mean by parental authority? So sometimes uh, uh, a parent can restrain his or her child. So because he has not attained the age of majority, so he can sometimes be restrained. So that's to ensure the safety of, of the child. So maybe a, a parent can argue before the court that uh, he was restraining the child just because of his or her safety to ensure that uh, they're actually uh, safe. So a parent has a right to reasonably chastise or discipline his children. So this means that where a parent beats his child or locks him up in a room for some time by way of reasonable chastisement, he cannot be sued for battery or false imprisonment. So similarly, if a parent gets a knife and threatens that he will cut off his child's mouth unless the child stops abusing grown-ups, no action can be brought against him for, the, for assault. When a child is at school, all his parents' right of ordinary control over him are delegated to the school authority or teachers and are exercised by the latter in, in the form of local parents. So reasonable chastisement by the school authority, e.g. reasonable punishment by teachers, is not actionable in tort. It's not actually actionable in tort. So you can't bring the action of tort in such a case whereby the teachers are trying to restrain the child or basically trying to control the movement of the child. So even in the schools, basically you'll see they have actually clearly demarcated, the, they have put the fence so that no student can actually escape from, from the school. So in such a case, uh, you can now basically go ahead and actually basically accuse the school administration of what you are calling false imprisonment because you can see they are restraining the movement of the children in the school. So they can be able to plead uh, what we call parental authority as a form of defense in case they have actually been accused of what you are calling uh, false imprisonment. Another form of defense, judicial authority. So an act done under the order of the court is not actionable as trespass. So should we show at the beginning of this chapter that the act done in judicial capacity are not actionable in tort. It follows that where a judge orders a corporal punishment of a number of strokes, no action for battery can be brought against him or a person administering strokes. So also statutory authority may be pleaded as a form of defense. So the judicial authority or basically if the judge makes a ruling before the court that a person gets some strokes of cans, strokes of cans, so it simply means that uh, that is basically uh, the authority they have been given to give that as a form of uh, punishment. So they can't be accused of false imprisonment or maybe battery or assault. So it is part of the requirements in terms of giving out punishment to persons who have actually committed a wrong. So judicial authority can actually still actually be. So remedies, we've said it can be damages. So damages can actually be someone is, that is an order that can be given by the court. So the writ of habeas coopers is a remedy for, to false imprisonment. The writ directs the, a person to show custody to a person in to show cast in to show custody. The applicant is detained to produce him before the high court. The court may order his release if it appears that there are not sufficient grounds for detaining him. For detaining him. So that is basically some of the remedies. Those are some of basically the remedies that can be used in case a person has been accused of what you are calling a false imprisonment. So what you need to remember here, we are saying that uh, under trespass to persons, under trespass to persons, we can have three categorizations. We can have assault, we can have battery, and we can have false imprisonment. So you should actually be able to understand at least each one of them, each one of them. Then the last, form of tort is actually basically what you are calling trespass uh, to goods. So owners of goods are entitled to enjoy their possession and control their use without any interference. So to protect goods, the common law developed three torts, namely detinue, trespass to goods, and conversion. So what is detinue? So this is the unlawful detention of a person. This tort relating to the protection 
of the must be able to prove he has a right, immediate right of possession to the goods or property. So the plaintiff is entitled to damages for the detention. So all losses incurred must actually be compensated or actually be paid to the plaintiff or complainant before the court. Then trespass to goods, trespass to goods. So this is the intentional or negligent interference of goods in possession of the plaintiff. So whereby you interfere, for example, open the goods without the authority of the plaintiff or the owner of the goods, then that one can actually be taken as being trespass uh, to goods, trespass to goods. So they have given examples of trespass to goods, for example, taking a chattel out of possession of another, moving a chattel. So what they mean by chattel are simply goods, goods may be in transit, so goods in transit. So contact with a chattel, directing a missile at a chattel. So what are the requirements under this particular tort? So the trespass must be very direct. The plaintiff must be in possession of the chattel at the time of interference. The tort is actionable the way it appears. The principal remedy is monetary award in damages. So monetary award in damages. What are the defenses? So they, we can have the plaintiff's consent, necessity, or we can have what we call mistake. So those are the defenses that can, that can be pleaded before the court in case of uh, what you are calling trespass with regard to goods. So you can have also conversion. So maybe these goods can actually be converted into another form. So without the authority of the owner. So this is the intentional day goods, which is seriously inconsistent to the possession or right of possession of another person's goods. So this tort protects a person's interest in dominion or control of the goods. So the plaintiff must have possession or the right to immediate possession. However, a bailey of goods can sue third parties in conversion. So can a licensee or a holder of lien or a finder. So any goods or chattel can be subject matter of conversion. So there must be physical contact resulting in interference with the goods, whereby there is any form of interference or intention to maybe interfere, let's say, for example, with the packaged goods and convert them into another form or maybe repack them into other units. So that is basically what we are calling uh, conversion. So uh, what they mean by a bailey of goods there, so a bailey is simply a person you can actually uh, maybe give you a goods to hold, to hold on your behalf for a particular period of time. An example you can be able to give, let's, let's say, for example, a cobbler. So if you give your shoe to a cobbler to repair, so he might stay with the shoe for, let's say, for example, two days. So it becomes the bailey of your goods in terms of the shoes. So that is what we mean by a bailey. So, so we are saying a bailey of goods can sue third parties in conversion to, so can a licensee or a holder of lien or a finder. So he has a right to be able to sue any third party who has intention to convert the goods that he are actually in his or her custody or are actually in his hands for safety. So that is what we mean by a bailey of goods. So maybe it could be a tailor. So you deliver a piece of cloth to your tailor. So that tailor becomes a bailey. So it is a kind of a contract whereby a person holds another person's goods for a number of uh, days, maybe a particular period of time. So while in possession of these particular goods, then he must ensure that the, these goods are actually, being, are actually being protected. So if it is a piece of shoe, the cobbler will ensure the piece of shoe is actually in a good condition. So failure to which you can hold that particular bailey responsible. So that is basically what we mean by uh, trespass. So that is what we mean by trespass. So you can have trespass to land trespass to persons, and of course you can have uh, trespass to goods, trespass to goods. So we can maybe look at defamation as another form of thought. So what do you mean by defamation? So it constitutes publication of false statements about a person, which ends up lowering the person's reputation in the estimation of right thinking members of the society without any form of justification. So whereby a person basically talks information about you, which is not actually factual or true, or true, simply lowering your dignity or basically your person's reputation or reputation in the society or community 
So in such a case, you can be able to accuse a person of what we call defamation. So defamation can actually be of two types. So you can have what we call libel and slander. So libel is defamation in a permanent form, while slander is defamation by simply by word of mouth, not in a permanent form. So what do you mean by libel in this case? It's, let's say, for example, it's a publication in a newspaper. So it becomes very permanent. So there's nothing you can be able to do about it. So, uh, but for slander, it's just by word of mouth. So maybe you can tell people, maybe after a number of days or maybe a few weeks, they have actually uh, forgotten. So, uh, so these are the key elements that must be present for the total of defamation to be seen to have been co uh, committed. So number one, the defendant must have made a false statement. So the statement that is being made is must actually be very false. So if it is a true statement, then it simply means that uh, maybe you can't plead or basically sue for defamation. The statement must be defamatory, that it arouses some form of ridicule or contempt from the right thinking members of the society. So it basically leads to or arouses ridicule. So people will start maybe ridiculing you as a result of the statement. The statement must refer to the plaintiff. So it must actually be very direct and be referring to the plaintiff. It should actually be made in, in the public. So it should actually be made in the, in the public. So those are some of the key elements of what you are calling defamation. So you are saying it can be of two types, libel or slander. So this is what you mean by slander. It is non-permanent form of defamation, usually by word of mouth. So this kind of defamation is actionable upon proof of damage. So that point is actually very important that it is actually actionable only upon uh, proving there was a damage that was actually caused. So if you can't prove damage, so if you can't prove damage, so it simply means that you can't bring an action of defamation under slander in such a case. So that statement that was actually made, it must be proved. It led to damages uh, or basically injuries being caused on you as the plaintiff. So if there are no any form of damages, then that particular action cannot actually be brought before the court as defamation under slander. So though there are some exceptions, so there are exceptions whereby you don't have to prove to prove there were, there were damages. For example, number one, where the statement imputes a criminal offense punishable by imprisonment. So if you just wake up one day or a person wakes, wakes up one day and actually accuses the other person of maybe having committed murder, so without having proved anything, so the person doesn't have to wait for the damages or repercussions. So that's why I say in such a yeah, case, yeah. you don't have to prove damage where a person is accusing another one of what you are calling maybe uh, murder or robbery with violence. So any criminal or imputing of a criminal offense against a person. So in such a case, if it is not actually factual or true, true, then it simply means that you don't have to wait for the damages or injuries to be incurred. You can simply bring that particular action before the court. So that's what you are saying. Uh, you don't have to prove damage. You don't have to prove damage. Uh, number two, where the statement imputes a contagious disease to the plaintiff. So in this, in this case also, you don't have to prove damage or wait for the damages or wait for people to start running away from you so that you can be able to go to the court. So immediately the statement is actually made, you go to the court and accuse the person of defamation. So what do you mean by contagious uh, diseases, diseases that are likely basically to spread very fast from a person to person. So this simply means that such, an, such a statement will make person to run away from you. They don't want to associate with you because you have what we call a contagious disease. So where the statement actually imputes unchastity on a woman, then the last one, where the statement imputes incompetence on the plaintiff in his trade, uh, occupation or profession. So you are basically like a qualified accountant. So you've been registered, you have been practicing as an accountant, but of course someone goes out there and actually simply claims you're actually incompetent in your area or basically in your profession. So for such a case, if you hear such kind of a statement, you don't have to prove the damages, that these damages occurred as a result of that particular statement. You can actually immediately bring the action before the court and of course accuse the person of what you are calling defamation. So libel, so this one is actually defamation in a permanent form, for example, in publications, 
maybe newspapers or magazines, so it remains permanent for a number of years. So this is a permanent form of defamation on the in the sense of that the statement is printed or documented. It is actionable the way it appears, that is without proof of uh, damage, without any proof of damage. So for libel, you don't have to prove also damage, just like in the four scenarios we've seen under slander. So for libel, once it has been met, you don't have to basically prove the damages because it is in a permanent form. And of course, a reference can be made as to what is the evidence that led to that particular defamation having to be uh, committed. So what are the differences between libel and slander? Libel and slander. So libel is defamation in a permanent form, whereas slander is defamation in transient form. So libel is not merely actionable as a tort, but it is also a, it is a criminal offense, whereas slander is a civil wrong. So the next one, all cases of libel are actionable the way they appear, but slander is only actionable on proof of actual damage without the four exceptions that we've basically been able to look at under slander. So those ones, uh, you don't have to prove damage, but for other torts under slander, then of course you have to prove there was a damage uh, so that the case can actually be had or the action can basically be brought uh, before uh, the court, the action can be brought before the court. So that is what we mean by uh, defamation, and that is what we mean by libel and slander. So what are the defenses, justification or pleading that it's the truth? So that's how a defendant can defend himself. So fair comment made as a matter of public interest, absolute privileges. So certain statements such as those made by judges in courts are not actionable since they are said to be absolute privilege. Qualified privilege. So when a person who makes the communication has a moral duty to make it to another person, who is interested in hearing it? So this is this is this is a qualified privilege. E.g., a preacher calling all the congregants in a church. They are actually seen as during a service. So, so that particular uh, preacher or maybe priest has a moral obligation. Offer of amends or apologies. So for example, if the defendant agrees to apologize, maybe coming out publicly and actually apologizing that the statements he actually made were not actually factual or true. So in such a case also, uh, he can actually be able to maybe defend himself in such a, such a way. So remedies, what are the remedies the court can be able to give? So they can give basically damages or ask for the compensation of damages. So they can ask for an apology to be made by the defendant. So if it is a continued defamation that actually happens from time to time, the court can give an injunction. So we say that is an order to stop the continuance of a particular act. So the court can give out what we call an injunction order. The court can give out what we call an injunction uh, order. So uh, maybe you can now look at occupier's liability as a form of another form of uh, tort. But in the meantime, maybe we can just have a break of like maybe two minutes, and then we can actually look at what is actually occupiers.
So we can, we can wind up by looking at occupier's liability. So what is occupier's liability? So what do you mean by occupier's liability? Just from the word occupy or occupier. It is someone who's basically occupying a property. So what are his duties and how can he actually be held responsible or liable? So in this case, we can give an example of uh, a supermarket an example of a supermarket that basically occupies a building. So that supermarket has certain responsibilities over those who are basically coming to the premises in terms of being able to shop. So they should, they should actually ensure, they should actually ensure they have put safety precautions or safety measures in terms of for all the shoppers visiting the premises because they are the occupiers of that particular building it simply means that they must be held responsible or accountable for all those who are coming to the building. So in case of any injury to any such kind of persons, they can be held responsible as the occupiers. So occupiers liability generally refers to the duty owed by land or premise owners to those who come onto their land. So it is very important you know that they are talking about uh, the duty that is actually basically owed by those who own. So the duty they have to those who come to the land. So those who own, what, do they, what duty they, do they have to those who come to their own land? So, however, the duties imposed on land premise owners can extend beyond simple land ownership. And in some instances, the landowners may transfer the duty to others, hence the term occupier rather than owner. The term occupier is actually very important because in this case, it can just be as with regard to the same aspect I was talking about either through possession or maybe ownership. Really owners, liability, occupier. So it can either be through uh, occupying through possession or maybe occupying through ownership. Let's say, for example, this supermarket has just leased the property. So they have rented the property. So the, the supermarket itself is the one that is actually liable uh, through what we are calling possession because they're the one occupying the property. So uh, that's what they're saying that uh, landowners may transfer the duty to others. So they might transfer the duty to others by simply being able to lease their properties. So, um, so what is expected of an occupier of a property? So what are the expectations? So the occupier owes a common duty of care to all his visitors. So all the visitors coming to his uh, property. So him as the occupier has to ensure that they actually safe. So there's a safety duty. So the common duty of care is to take such care as in all the circumstances of the case is enabled to see that the visitor will be reasonably safe in using the premises for the purposes for which is invited or permitted by the occupier to be there. Number two, visitors are persons who have expressed or implied permission to enter or use the premise of a person. So lawful visitors to whom occupiers or the common duty of care for the purpose of occupiers liability include invitees, so those that have been invited, licenses, so those who have been licensed, for example, to come and visit the premises. So those entering in exercising their right conferred by law, for example, a person entering to read an electricity meter. So the standard of care varies according to the circumstances. So you most probably might realize that in the case of children, uh, uh, you must ensure a lot of safety. So a lot of care must be ensured. So an occupier must be prepared for children to be less careful than adults. So children probably need to ensure that uh, their safety is actually well guarded. So adults, so they can be able to control themselves. So the level or standard of safety, it basically just depends with, for, let's say, for example, the persons visiting uh, the premises. Then the occupier may expect that a person in the exercise of his calling will appreciate and guard against any special risks ordinarily incident to it. So the occupier is not liable for negligence of an independent contractor. So if he hired services of an independent contractor, let's say for example, to maybe cast the occupiers because of the negligence of uh, the independent contractor. Then the common duty of care does not impose on an occupier any obligation to a visitor who has willingly accepted the risk. So if you voluntarily or willingly accept the risk, so the occupier won't actually 
uh, basically be held responsible for such. So for example, if they have clearly indicated you walk slowly because the floor is actually slippery in the supermarket. So if you end up walking very fast, that, that simply means you've actually accepted the risk because you are not following the instructions that have been given by the supermarket. So by walking very fast, you can end up slipping or basically falling down. And of course you can actually be injured. So you can't blame the risk because it is by your fault. It is by your fault. Instructions have clearly been given you walk slowly because the floors are actually slippery. So uh, that is basically what we mean by occupiers liability. That is basically what we mean by occupiers uh, liability. So I think next time we'll be able to wind up, we'll wind up with occupiers liability. Then of course, wind up with the general defenses under tort. So these ones are probably the ones you've already looked at as we've been looking through the chapters, we've come across them. Volentin and Fitunjari, inevitable accident, act of God, self-defense, mistake, necessity, or statutory authority. So we'll look at all of them. And of course, now wind up with this particular topic and then start the topic of law of contract. Start the topic of law of contract. Start the topic of law of contract in our next class. So there's just remaining a small bit. And then we can be able to start the law of I can see, I can see uh, uh, Masi saying she's, when I share the screen, she's actually dozing off. So maybe next time I think I'll uh, not share the screen, but basically I'll explain or elaborate on the board. So I'll explain or elaborate on the, on the board. So I prefer the earlier way of you introducing the topics, explaining without having to share. So I think next time I won't share the screen notes. I'll just 